All right. Well, we're here to get something from God. And I hope this helps you out. We are live. Don't forget to visit our website at lyitl.org for lovingord.org. Uh, our server got hacked. And, uh, I mean, it was just malware with Trojans everywhere. And so they shut our server off. And so I asked God for leadership and guidance because I've never had to deal with the malware deal on the server. But I went to deleting files like crazy. I asked the Holy Spirit, help me to know what to delete, right? And so after about a week and a half, uh, we got the malware taken care of. And now our loving the Lord is back online. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, because there are people all the way around the world that are tuning in and listening to the sermons that we have. And say, how do you know that? Uh, they'll send a response. They'll make a comment. But we're so glad you're here. And so uh, we're talking about the significance of biblical worship. And uh, we learned a lot about Moses. And we're in Exodus chapter uh, 33. We did bounce around to chapter 32 and 34. So uh, I want to give a kind of a quick little backup review of this. Uh, when people think about church, they think about going and attending just like they would a football game, basketball game, or whatever. But it's not. It's more than that. It's a place where when we come here, we enter into a mode of worship, real worship, biblical worship. And so if you, and I've seen churches, that, and I'm not running them down, but you know, you got the smoke going in the background, you got the fancy lights everywhere, and you got the praise and worship team sing, singing the same six words over and over and over again, and then people raising their hand, jumping up and down in some places and bouncing off walls, and, but that's not true worship. And I'm not knocking it, okay? I, I'm all for an emotional service, okay? But if you want to know biblically what real worship is, Exodus chapter 33 talks about that, okay? And uh, we, we noticed that, that uh, as we studied this, that Moses was at a place in his life where God's going to call on him to do a miraculous work, and that is to lead. You see, how do you know they were Baptists? Because they were rebellious? Because they were stiff-necked? Hard, hard. I'm just teasing on that, all right? But no, but they were a hard, a stiff-necked people, very rebellious to God. In fact, when Moses... Now, this is a sermon that I would normally talk about, the mountaintop experience. Moses goes up on the mountaintop, and he spends some time with God, about, you know, uh, 40 days. And then when he comes back down, guess what he finds? All of the people have gone nuts. Craziness. You know? Uh, I mean, it's, they, they were having sexual orgies. And they were doing perverse things. They made a golden calf. And they were worshiping the golden calf. And uh, it was just horrible. Nancy, we're glad to have you. So we are part two on the significance of biblical worship. And so uh, Exodus chapter uh, 33 is where we started, uh, you know, today. And uh, so Moses seeks for a new vision, for a new task, okay? So let's go ahead and jump down to uh, uh, Exodus chapter 33 and down to verse 18, all right? So this is part two, and we've learned that that uh, getting up... Let's, let me explain this to you. Josh, if, if God was to walk literally in that door right now and walk in, and His glory is so awesome and so fierce, it'd be like a huge tornado coming through here in a sense but yet with a sense of peace and comfort, right? But he had to hide Moses, you remember, in the cleft of the rock. Because when he came through, he came through with his presence, his glory. And when he did that, it made all the change in the world. And God had to protect him. But Moses has been communing with the Lord. He enjoyed a walk of the deepest intimacy with the Lord in Exodus 33, 11. But go back to verse 18. We find that Moses seeks a new vision for what? A new task. Look what he says. And he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee. Underline that. All right? And I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. And I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And he said... 
thou can, uh, cannot, cannot see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. All right? And he goes on to say, verse 21, And the Lord, and uh, Catherine and James, glad to have you. We're in Exodus chapter 33, verse 21. And the Lord said, Behold, there's a place by me. Did you get that? There is a place. I want you to underline that. We talked about that this morning. There is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock. So what happened? Verse 22. And it shall come to pass. Now watch this. My glory passeth by. Circle that. That I will put thee in the cliff of the rock. Underline that. And will cover thee with my hand while I pass by. Underline that. Verse 23. And I will take away my hand and thou shalt see my back parts but my face shall not be seen. We couldn't handle it, could we? The God of all glory. But yet, uh, if you'll remember, uh, uh, God had told them in the previous chapter that because of your sin and rebellion, I'm not going to go with you. And Moses intercedes again and said he reminded them that this is your people. You are their God. And he asked a simple request. Will you go with us? He didn't ask for money. He didn't ask for big buildings. He just asked for the presence of God's glory. And I wonder today, could we or could we not maybe make that our prayer? Lord, that your glory will come in and around me in such a way that it will change me from the inside out. So, once again, Moses enjoyed a walk of the deepest intimacy with the Lord. And the closest with God distinguishes Moses from every other person that was living in that day. Nobody else seemed to want to walk with God. Nobody else wanted to have the glory of God, the blessing of God. And so, Luke, but here's a man. Here's a man that, that is, is willing to go before the Lord. And he asks for one thing. He says, because he says, if you won't go with us, I'm not going. Now, normally I would teach a sermon on that. If God's not going to be part of it, why would I be a part of it? Right? So, but, but finally God comes back and, and says, I will go with you. So this closeness with God uh, uh, distinguishes Moses from all the people living in that day. They, they had no real, there was nobody else. That when Moses came down off of that mountain, they'd been with God. There was nobody standing up and trying to declare to the people that this is wrong, this is sinful, and, and that we need to get back right with God. I mean, it was total chaos going on. And then Moses, he said, man, I've had it up to here. You know what he did? He threw the tablets down and broke them. Remember that? Anybody else had it up to here? He said, you want me to take these people? These are not just hard-necked. Listen, they, they are hardcore. They are hardcore sinners. And so, I mean, every sensual, sexual thing you could imagine was going on. And, and, and that, on top of that, what made it worse is they formed a golden calf and they began to what? To worship the golden calf, which was far worse than any other physical sin that they could have ever done. So he was very intimate. In fact, I talked about this. Even 1,500 years after he had died, we find that, that he still has that glow. God allowed his head to glow, his body to glow. And yet, whenever uh, the, we get to the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we know that. We find here that in Matthew 17, 3, it says, And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with him. Right? So in other words, even 1,500 years later, here he is still under that anointing of God. If you go back and read your Bible, you'll find that, that, they, that these uh, people, uh, that, that they had saw these angelic beings, which was really Moses and Elijah. He said, they are anointed with the presence of God. They, so 1,500 years later, Michaela, here is Moses once again, uh, uh, even after he died and was alive, now he's got more of God's glory than ever before. Everybody saw through the angelic vision, vision they had this glorious experience, right? So the closeness with God, now let me say this slowly, the closeness with God distinguishes Moses from every other person 
living in that day. The closeness with God, right? And it, it, that closeness was carried not only to death, but even after death, even 1,500 years later, here is, here is Moses in all, standing in, in all of God's glory around him and, and being used of God in that day. And, and so uh, the closeness of the Lord caused him to want to worship God. Now, this is big. So, Luffy, if I'm not close to God during the week, I'm not going to even want to worship God at the beginning of the week. So you see, the closeness that we have with God on a regular basis, Ryan, if, if, if we don't do that, then church becomes nothing more than an event. And, and we're here, it, it should cause us to be changed. It should cause us to want to worship God in such a way that the biggest thing we could do in this church is before we leave, is to bow our faces before Him. And get on our knees and pray to Him. And worship Him. And thank Him. And glorify Him. So once again, we find that the closeness to the Lord causes Him to want to what? Worship God from a biblical worship sense. Alright? And so we saw, talked about the bold request of Moses. We, we talked about the balanced response of God. Uh, God, God makes a promise. And, he, and the tigger, He says, I'm going to go with you. My glory is going to go with you. All right? And, and, but Moses wanted evidence, didn't he? And, and so why did he do this? The answer lies in verse 17 of, of Exodus chapter uh, 33. Let's go back there and read verse 17. And he says what? And the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken. For thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. Wow. That last part of that sentence is amazing. God knows you by name. No matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, He knows you by name. He's in a personal relationship with, with you. He says, For thou hast found grace in my sight. Can somebody say amen to that? Amen. For grace, right? And so, once again, God makes a promise. And so why did God do this? Because Moses had found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Oh my gosh, today, uh, Victoria, if there's ever a time I need to recognize that God's grace is what's got me here. It's God's grace that's got me through. It's God's grace that's going to lead me through. It's God's grace that's going to save me. It's God's grace that's going to empower me. It's God's grace that's going to help me come to a, an understanding of what real biblical worship is. All right? So, once again, Moses had found grace. Where? In the eyes of the Lord. In other words, Moses had not earned his experience. It was the sovereign choice of an almighty God, right? And just the fact that we are allowed to pray to him, to worship him, to communicate with him is amazing. Wow. You know, if you've never watched uh, Louis Gigolo and some of his CDs and DVDs about, you know, the world of God, how big our God is and how how small it is that you still find a deal called laminin that holds us together. Those are amazing CDs to get your hands on and to watch. We try to show them every year. But, but I want you to notice here that no matter how big God is or how intimate God can be, the smallest particle known in the universe, the fact is God knew him by name. Isn't that amazing? And uh, not only that, but in verses 21 and 23... Uh, God mentions a place. God tells Moses there's a place by him where Moses can stand and see the glory of God as the glory of God passes by. And that place is in the cleft of the rock. Now, how many know today that Jesus is that rock? If we're in Jesus, then we can experience the glory of God. In Jesus, if we've been saved in Jesus, right? Then we'll have an understanding about the presence of God that the flesh could never understand. Why? Because it's a spiritual experience, right? So there's still a place, and notice what it said, by him, right? So God tells Moses there's a place by him where Moses can stand and see the glory of God without dying. And, and you know, wouldn't it be great that if that place today could be started right here at College Heights Baptist Church, just with some people that want to seek his glory, and be in the presence of God. 
and the outpouring of real worship goes to God. In fact, if you think about it, any time God showed up, even about the animals, think about this. They bowed their head, didn't they? Well, you know what? That's exactly what Moses did. We talked about that this morning. And uh, uh, we talked about uh, how the, the, what happened was is because Moses had gone through this transformation experience with God and everything else, guess what the results was? The Bible says he what? He bowed his head and worshipped. He didn't jump up and down, scream and holler. Nothing wrong with worshiping God with everything you got. But that's but, the, but we're talking about biblical worship here, because biblical worship is not something that comes from a program. It comes from a person. Does that make sense? So it's not about the smoke and the lights and all this stuff. It, what it's really about is are are have, are you experiencing the presence of God in your life and an area to where. It humbles your heart. And, and when, with a humble heart, normally comes a bended knee. And that's why I can remember back when in our church, Terry, you probably remember this, we were running, you know, gosh, you were from 90 to 100 people, you know, and, and we're a small building. But the biggest event was not in the preaching or the singing. It was in the altar call where people came and put their hands in their, and their face in their hands and they would close their eyes, tears would flow, and they would repent. And they, they understood then what it was. It was not, hey, Mike, glad to have you here. But we're in Exodus chapter 33 talking about the significance of biblical worship, right? And, and so you have to understand that, that uh, it's a privilege to be able to pray to God and, and talk with God. In fact, what an honor it is to be able to open up what you and I call the Word of God and read it and study it as we are today. And, and so in verses 5 and 6, two things. The Lord stood what? With him there. See, maybe you're in a place right now and God's hiding you in that special place, that cleft of the rock. And, and he's got you through this. And I know, Josh, you and I were kind of talking about that. Well, when you wake up in the morning, it makes you really appreciate being alive on this earth, right? We know that. And so what are you saying? I'm saying God passed by. Oh, somebody say hallelujah, amen. It's not that we came and, and the preacher preached a sermon. It's not that we had cookies and, and, and donuts and all that, even though all that stuff's great. But I promise you, uh, uh, real biblical worship comes from whenever you've walked with God and God has reached down and, and you realize He's by your side and it causes a response, all right? So verse 5 says, The Lord stood with him there. Verse 6 says, And the Lord passed by. So he, he, here is Moses standing in the rock, surrounded by the rock, right? In the presence of the Lord, which shielded, listen, it was by the hand of God, and seeing the glory of God all at the same time. Can you imagine that? Wow. Can you imagine seeing the glory of God up and close and personal? Wow. You know what that did? Now remember, God had called Moses to do what? To lead the children of Israel, which is a very rebellious, very sinful crowd of people, into the promised land. Remember that? So Moses needed some encouragement, didn't he? So what happened was, Moses, did, he said, you know, uh, you have to understand, this experience with God is a life-changing moment with Moses. Why? Because it changed his life. It changed the way he thought. It changed the way he worshipped. And every now and then we get a small dose of, of a manifestation of the presence of God. Sometimes we'll come in and, and God will demonstrate His glory here in our church. I can remember times we would preach and then at the toward the end of the service and everything else, it was God's glory that made the difference in the service to the people. All right? One time, uh, uh, God led me uh, as, as our church was maxed out and had people coming down the hallways just to hear the sermon. And all of a sudden, we get up there and everybody's expecting to have a song service. But that's not where God led me. We gave an invitation without a song service. We gave an invitation without human preaching. We just gave an invitation. But the anointing of God was so real at this place that people were coming to the altars 
People were lined up down the hallway, and people were bowing their head. People were getting, if they were lost, they were getting saved. If they were saved and, and yet kind of uh, physically lost in a sense, they were getting things right. They were repenting. And man, you talk about a service. Man, after we got through with that invitation, the altars have been filled, people were saved and all that stuff. You say, well, what's next? How do you follow that? <laughs> I mean, what am I going to do, preach a sermon? Well, I did, but you don't, I'd much rather see the anointing of God in people's lives more than somebody going back and saying, Preacher, what a great sermon. Because, you know, I, don't get me wrong, I like to hear that people like the sermon, but if that's all you got, and you, didn't, and you walk out here without saying, Wow, what a great God, then I have failed. So, same way with you and I. God manifests His presence. In chapter 34, verses, what, uh, 5 through 7 that we talked about earlier. Uh, look at what he says here. He says, and this is a new vision, right? And the Lord descended in the cloud, that's a Shekinah glory cloud, and stood with him there. There he is again, underline that. And proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed. What did he proclaim? The Lord, the Lord God merciful and gracious, long-suffering, abundant and goodness and truth. And then he says in verse 7, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that, and that will by no means, look at this, by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, upon the children's children, and the third and to the fourth generation. And, but look at verse 8. Watch this. This is the key. Circle this whole entire verse. Victoria. Moses hears God saying, I'm, I'm not going to take and let you get by with being sinful. Uh, you, you're not just going to go flying through life. Listen, we're going to deal with this. That's what verse uh, 7 was all about. For the mercy of God for thousands. He said, we're going to change some things, right? But look in verse 8. Here it is, Tigger. And Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and did what? And worshipped. You see, biblical worship is when you're at a place in your life where it's not about putting on a show, it's not about fog machines, and, and I'm not running anything down. If you've got fog machines, God bless you. If you've got special lighting, God bless you. If you've got uh, people playing guitars and, and playing bongos and and the drums and all that. Hey, God bless you. I wish we had all that too. It's just it's a lot more fun enjoying that type of service. I got that. But what if God visited every one of us tonight? Just like he did with Moses. And the anointing was so strong that it changed your life forever. Okay? So, uh, can you imagine seeing the glory of God up close and personal? Moses did. And what did it do? Changed his life. Can you imagine what church would be like if everybody here was to get a hold of the glory of God? You know, I think about some of the things like uh, when you think about the upper room experience in John chapter 20, whenever uh, Jesus walked in to that upper room where the disciples were there, did you know that changed their life? They had walked with him, they saw him crucified, and then the grave was empty, and now they're, what? they're still upstairs hiding away. But it, what got him out of that upper room? I, I have a sermon I preached on what will get you out of the upper room. And it was because they saw a resurrected Jesus. They saw him in all of his glory, right? So, uh, so once again, why am I saying that it's when a, a genuine move of God takes place in our church, we will become lost in the glory of Jesus Christ, okay? And I ended our sermon this morning when I talked to you about how the, I heard Jerry Johnson preach at a youth camp. And, and all I could do is out of the 250 young people there, I didn't see them when the invitation was given. I just knew I needed to go down. And I was not a religious man. This is, I, was, I, I didn't go to church, but I happened to drive a bus, wanted to drive a bus, to a bunch of kids down to a youth camp. And, uh, and I did. But here I am, a grown man. But yet, when Jerry Johnson, when they gave that invitation, all I could focus on was the presence of God in my life. And the second night, same way. I went from the tears to, you know, to asking God to use me. 
you know, and just a full surrender on that third night, a full surrender. It altered my life forever. The only reason why I'm even preaching tonight is because of the grace and the mercy of God upon my wicked old life. Amen? And so, but it changed me. And so we looked at the bold request of Moses, number one. We looked at the, at the balanced response of the Lord, number two. And then the beautiful results for both in chapter 34, verses 8, all the way through 35. So after this mountaintop experience, Moses was never the same. Somebody say amen. amen. All right? And no one can, uh, can come face to face with the Lord and remain the same. You just can't. There will always be some sign that you've been with God, okay? Remember Jacob at, at Peniel in Genesis chapter 32, verses 24 through 32? Listen, he encountered God, and what did God do? God touched what? His leg. And then he had a limp on his thigh from that moment on. Saul of Tarshish, that we know as Paul, uh, uh, were marked men by having spent time with the Lord in Acts uh, uh, Acts chapter 9 verses 1 through 8 remember when, when Saul was on the road to Damascus and Jesus appeared and in all of his glory and that white light and everything and all, of, all of a sudden it knocked him off of his horse you know what that changed him and three days later uh, I believe that Paul understood what it meant to be in a relationship with God and his life was changed from that moment on. Remember the disciples in Acts chapter 4, verse 13? They were marked men by having spent time with the Lord. And so notice uh, what, what seeing God will do. What will it do? i tell you what it's going to do. It's going to manifest some things. There will also benefit uh, those that, that, that go in the direction of God. Why? Because it's not about going in my direction. It's about me going in the direction of God. God wanted Moses to go out and lead all these wicked people and, and take them to the promised land, right? So there were some benefits that went in God's direction. So what does that mean? Moses was blessed by this powerful experience, but God benefited too. How did God benefit too? Because Moses was strengthened. You get that? Moses was strengthened in his walk with the Lord because of his experience. God received worship. What did he do? He bowed his head and he what? He worshiped God. And Moses became a better servant for the glory of God from this moment on. He was determined, all right? And so what did it produce? Verses 8 and 29. It produced what? Humility. Ding dong. <laughs> it produced humility, right? When we see the Lord as He is, we, we cannot help but see ourselves as we are. Let me say it again. When we see the Lord as He is, you cannot help but see ourselves as we are. Just a sinner in need of a Savior. And, and once we're saved, we, we need that Savior to lead us and to guide us in our life. We think that we are much better and more holier than, as, than what we really are. And a good glimpse of God will change all that and will produce genuine humility in your life. Les, we're glad to have you. James, we're glad to have you. We're in Exodus chapter uh, 33 and 34. So we get humbled and then the Lord can use us for His glory. Let me say it again. Until you are humbled, you'll always think you're better than somebody or you've attained more. No, listen, I'm just a sinner. Uh, needing, you know, saved by the grace of God, the mercy of God. So, what does it do when you have that experience with God? When I had that experience at the Singing Hills Youth Camp in Albuquerque, New Mexico, I was a grown man, and it was a youth camp for kids, right? But you know what? God knew my name, and God called me out of that seat. And on the first day, the the tears just flowed, and I didn't know why. The second day, I, I began to pour my heart out to God. And on the third day, I said, God, I am yours. Whatever you need of me, I will do. Somebody asked me, he said, well, did you surrender to preach? No, I surrendered to serve him. I surrendered to follow him. I surrendered my life to him. And if God could do anything in my life, what a miracle that would be. Why? Because if God can change me, he can change anybody. Does that make sense? 
And from that day forth, I lived for Jesus Christ. Whether I drove a bus, whether I mowed the lawn, whether I, I done the care of the toilets, whatever I did, I did it as service to God. Why? It changed my life. James 4.10 says, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall what? Lift you up. Moses was the only fellow in the camp who did not know that his face glowed with the glory of God. There were no mirrors hanging around. The people could see the presence of God. That he had been in the presence of God. Right? What a lesson for you and I today. It's not about you know how big of a program that we put on. It's have I been in the presence of God? And you say, well, how do you know that? Because in verse 29, Moses, like I said, was the only fellow in the camp who did not know that he was glowing all over. Everybody else could see it, right? So I believe that if you have really been in the presence of God, it's going to produce, in verse number 8, if you go back and look at that, Exodus chapter 34, verse number 8, what's it going to produce? Real worship. Biblical worship. And, and, and biblical worship never draws attention to itself. If anything, it will cause us to bow our head and give all the glory and all the praise to God Himself. Does that make sense? Now, I'm not knocking a praise team. I'm not saying we shouldn't have you know, the fun live music. But I would trade all that in just to be able to, for our church right now to experience the very presence of Almighty God. A presence that is going to change us from the inside out. How does it do that? When Moses saw the Lord uh, uh, as he really was, it caused Moses to fall before him and give honor to him. All right? So he responded with simply adoring the Lord. And, and, and what we think is worship usually is not. It's not about singing and testifying, praying and preaching and everything else. All those things may be involved in what we call worship, but just because one or more of these takes place in a service does not mean that real worship has occurred. Does that make sense? Genuine worship, now write this down, involves the heart above all. Genuine worship involves the heart above all. Genuine worship, there is a desire from your heart to exalt God. A desire to see Him and receive uh, uh, the glory that He is worthy of receiving. So you say, why would you go to church? Because He's worthy of receiving glory and honor and praise from you and I. He died on the cross as God. He paid my sin debt as God. And He arose on the third day as God. And He went to His kingdom as God. You say, well, why would I go to church? Because when you come to church, it's your way of saying that we're going to not only encourage one another, but what are we doing? We're honoring Him and saying He deserves that worship and that praise and that dedication. Jesus is worth you coming to church. Does that make sense? And so it's not about coming and just sitting in a seat and, and hearing the preacher preach. Hey, listen, from each and every one of you who've been saved, can you imagine, let me give you an illustration, since you guys walked in from the nursery. She's fixing to be one years old coming up, right? Can you imagine having a birthday party and nobody shows up? Why? When she grows up, she's probably going to beat the snot out of you. <laughs> Amen? You know? And, uh, but what are you saying? Can you imagine having a church that's supposed to worship God, love God, honor God from your heart, but yet we don't show up? And what if we showed up, but yet our hearts were never surrendered? So it's a big deal. It, it, listen, when you see His glory, our worship will change. Did you write that down? When you see His glory, our worship will change. When you've been in His presence, your worship will change. It will change an individual level uh, on a personal level, on a public level. When we see Jesus in all of His glory, our worship will be about Jesus and nothing more. Nothing plus, nothing minus. It's all about Jesus Christ. It will become, uh, uh, you'll find that according to St. John chapter 4, verse 24, it will become that which the Lord desires it to be. What is it? Listen, John 4, 24. God is a spirit, 
And they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. It will not be about you know, some fleshly display. It will be about the Lord God Almighty and Him alone. Verse 29, what did it produce? It produced an outward change. Go back and look at verse 29, if you will. All right? Acts 34. Let me get this down here. Still trying to read with my without my glasses here tonight. But look what it says. And it came to pass when Moses came down from the Mount Sinai with the two tables of testimony in Moses' hand, when he came down from the mount, that Moses wist not that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. You know what it did? It produced an outward change that people could see. And can people see that your experience with God, can they see the outward change? You see, the evidence of spending time with the Lord was all over Moses. It was undeniable. And the same can be true today for your life and my life too. Our face may not glow, but our walk and our talk and our lives will appear to be to bear witness to the fact that we are walking with the Lord in His grace, in His mercy, in His power, and in His presence. What we need today, and we, we are praying that God would send some people that really want to worship God and serve God and, and be a part of this ministry. But I'll tell you what we need more than just people. We need the presence of God. Like more now than ever before. Uh, and, and so it does not mean that He loves one more than another. But it does mean that He reveals Himself uh, more to those who are walking close to Him. So He will speak more directly through His Word. He will manifest His presence more often in your heart. And then He will use you more wonderfully for His glory. So as we close this down, let me ask you this. Do you have any reason to worship the Lord? You say, why would you ask that? Well, if you do, then, then you are giving Him worship that He deserves. Somebody say, hallelujah. hallelujah. So when you showed up tonight, you're giving the worship. And he deserves it. He is God. He is our God, our Savior. And so it, when you really worship God from your heart. I used to tell, our, we used to have a, a fairly decent choir. And I remember telling them one day, what if I pull the black curtain up here and turn the lights out? Would you sing the same? You see, I wonder in our church, well, in our church service, if we don't get the electric bill paid, this lights are going to be out anyway. Amen. And, uh, but the amazing thing is, what, what if we, what if we t tuned it out to where nobody can see nothing, but all they can do is experience God? They don't see the, the big you know, church stills or the small church stills. Nothing wrong with the programs. But what if we just turned out the lights? What if we just pulled the curtain across where nobody could take, say, look at me? I wonder how that would change. You see, what did it produce? Verses 34 through 35. It produced a special relationship with God. You see, He will speak more directly through His Word. He will manifest His presence often in your heart that normally he, you wouldn't have experienced. And He will use you more wonderfully for His glory. So listen, do you have any reason to worship God? Yes. Uh, if, you, if you don't, then wouldn't you like to know that you can be saved today, know Jesus, and have your, your sins washed away, your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life, so that one day you'll spend eternity? Hey, what did the thief on the cross say, Lupe? Remember me when thou goest into thy kingdom. Does that make sense? Listen, we're going to spend eternity somewhere. You're either going to spend it with God, or you're not going to spend it with God. And the Bible is very clear. We're going to spend eternity in the presence of God if we're saved. If we're not, go back and read Luke chapter 16, 19 through 31. It's, a, it's from the words of Jesus. And then you'll find that the rich man died and went to hell. Did y'all get that? All right. So listen, listen, watch this right here. Who among us today has a heart like the heart of Moses? You say, well, no, I'd like to have a heart like that. Who among us is over, has an overwhelming desire to see the glory of God and to get lost in His worship? Does that make sense? Well, if that describes you, then I challenge you to get before Him even tonight. If, if, if sometimes some people, some people just turn around and get on their face before God. I understand. That's what's really important today. So listen, ask God to manifest His glory 
in your life from this moment on. The worship of God is a significant matter. It literally has the power to change a life. has the power to change your life. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus that, Father, that if there will be one listening or is it tonight or somewhere down the line, and that, Lord, that they make it this far through the message, that your presence will begin to just fall around them and on them and, and that you would pass through them in such a way that they would have a desire to be saved just like the thief on the cross that said listen we de- I'm a sinner we deserve this but I know that you're the savior Lord remember me when thou goest into thy kingdom and that moment in time when you turn and, and yet you look like a beaten beast and yet you turn with that with one of your last breaths and said today thou will be with me in paradise Oh, Father, today, it was by your promise that that rich man, I mean, that, that, that thief was going to be in the kingdom of God. It was because of your word and your promise that, the, that uh, in Luke 16, 19 to 31, that Lazarus was in your presence. So, Father, we know that we're saved by a promise from you. So here it is. Dear Lord Jesus, pray this prayer. I know I'm a sinner. And I know that you're God. And I know that you died on that cross. You paid for my sins. And you arose on the third day. And you are now in your kingdom. So I call upon you. Save me, Lord. Come into my heart right here, right now. Lord, just save me. Make me a child of God. Put your name in my life. And I just want to glorify you. Change the way I think. Change the way I love. And change the way I act. And Lord, at the end of it all, Lord, may we find the true presence of worship as we bow our heads and as we close our eyes. And then Lord, just like Moses, He gave glory and honor to you. Oh, Father, I pray that Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and worshipped. Father, may that be the, the beginning of our services every time. That we want to worship you and give you glory, honor, and praise. And we thank you again for the ministry you've allowed us to have here. We thank you for the word of God that you protected through the ages. But we thank you for your presence. And we pray now for your leadership and guidance in all of our lives. And we love you. Hugs and kisses in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.